All right, good morning, uh, everyone, and or good afternoon, uh, or good evening, perhaps, depending where you might be coming from. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We're very excited uh, to have you to help us launch our COP27 toolkit, the Climate Reality to Egypt toolkit. We've got a, a stellar lineup of panelists uh, for you to hear from today. Uh, we'll have a few more people joining us through the virtual back door, but let's get proceedings kicked off. Uh, please note that this is being recorded, so I'd appreciate if you could just stay on mute uh, unless you're speaking, of course. So uh, just to, to begin with, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have lived sustainably and in harmony with the land for tens of thousands of years and together we strive for the future of the land and the air and the water. So I want to start today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the unceded lands on which we work, we learn and we live. So that's the Wurundjeri, Waiwurrung and Bunurong peoples. I want to pay our deepest respects to their elders past, present, and those who are coming through. I also want to extend that to all First Nations people we have on the call today, including our indigenous panelist, Kira, joining us from Aotearoa, New Zealand. I encourage all of you to, um, all of you on this call to acknowledge in the chat, the indigenous lands and waters that you're joining today's session from. So just to run through the, the agenda, uh, first of all, my name is Kieran McCormack and I manage the Australia and Pacific region for the Climate Reality Project. So what we're going to be talking about is of course, the Climate Reality to Egypt tool, Toolkit. Uh, we'll have Professor Don Henry explain to us what is needed from this region at COP27. Then we've got uh, three excellent climate reality leaders um, joining us with their contributions, Richie Merzian, Kira Sherwood O'Regan, and Dr. Anika Molesworth. Then we'll jump into six ways that uh, we would like you to act for climate between now and COP27 in Egypt, uh, following, followed then by Don Henry, uh, explaining how you can engage your local politician with this toolkit. And then we'll round off proceedings with a Q&A. And look, um, it'd be great to see some uh, questions coming through uh, throughout the session. So feel free to, to put those into the chat. So at this point, um, I'll hand over to Professor Don Henry. Uh, so uh, Don, um, Don is also based uh, in the University of Melbourne as the Melbourne Enterprise Professor of Environmentalism. He directs the Climate Reality Project Australia and Pacific program and is an international board member of the Climate Reality Project. So Don, you're a veteran of COP negotiations. Could you set the scene for us this morning um, of the themes that we've set in the toolkit and the key messages that we would like participants to use? To use? Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Kieran, and uh, a warm welcome to everybody. Uh, it's great to be here uh, with you. Um, I, I want to acknowledge the speakers who we've got today. A big thank you to Richie, uh, Kiara, uh, Anika, um, who are joining us, which is absolutely fabulous. They'll help us through some details here. Uh, I also want to acknowledge and sincerely thank uh, Kieran and Imogen, for their wonderful work. There's a lot of hard work behind the scenes on this uh, that they're doing to help support you, the climate leaders. And most importantly, I want to acknowledge all the climate leaders uh, on this call. People make a big difference in lots of different ways. We all know how um, inspiring the training sessions are with Al Gore, but a big piece of that inspiration is the diversity and passion and capabilities of people in those rooms. So thank you for what uh, everybody does in so many different ways. Um, uh, Kieran, I'll, uh, to take up your uh, question, I thought I might first answer why 
why COP? Why are they important and how we can make a difference? Uh, but firstly, um, as I said just before, climate leaders across this region come from a huge um, diversity of backgrounds and people make a big difference in lots of different ways. And that's really, really important. But we always get uh, feedback from you that there's an appetite for local and regional materials, um, actions and impact. And coming out of that, last year and this year, again, we've sort of thought carefully about that and have thought, well, look, one of the areas that we might be able to help leaders make a big difference for that's relevant, particularly for a region, we're covering Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific, is the annual international climate negotiations. Now, why? So there's three things that really happen uh, around the international negotiations. Uh, one is what's agreed in the formal negotiations. From, for example, uh, the last negotiations were in Glasgow. Um, you know, you can look at them glass half empty, glass half full. Um, the Glasgow Pact or agreement that came out of it had a number of important dimensions in it, but it emphasised the importance of holding average global warming below 1.5 degrees, which is really helpful. It's sort of a bit of a tightening or an emphasis on the lower band of the Paris Agreement. And there are a number of other helpful things in that agreement, but we should always bear in mind the UN processes are a consensus process, their lowest common denominator, so they can be pretty frustrating. Uh, before the COP, and this is really important, uh, all countries were asked to bring new national commitments to the table. Most of this happened before, some at that Glasgow COP, and the same is happening again this year. And you would have already seen that need and that opportunity has meant that the new Australian government has strengthened uh, our 2030 uh, commitment. It's still modest, but it's substantially strengthened. And they've already submitted that into the UN um, in a legal document uh, that says, hey, this is what we're going to do. So <clears throat> what individual countries submit into the COPs and before them are really important. There's also actually some strong commitments from Pacific Island nations coming in as well. And then the third thing, because the negotiations are the lowest common denominator, uh, countries who agree on important issues, but it may not involve everybody, often strike side agreements. And so, for example, at last year's negotiations, some important side agreements were struck on forest conservation, uh, on cutting methane emissions globally, and many others. So it's worth while remembering three things happen around these COPs. Bottom line, it provides an opportunity for all of us to influence what national governments like Australia or New Zealand or Pacific Island nations commit to, uh, what they actually do in the international negotiations, and whether they can speed up climate action on issues that not everyone might agree with. And so bearing all of that in mind, what we've done is produce a toolkit uh, for those climate leaders that are interested in raising awareness and making a difference around these opportunities for the international negotiations. And I'll just draw your attention to just a couple of elements of the toolkit. Um, we've got sort of key messages for policymakers. Now, that can be the Australian government, the New Zealand government, or a Pacific Island nation. Uh, and we've developed these with best knowledge, uh, with feedback from climate leaders. There's been a small group of climate leaders, I want to thank them, who've helped review and work with the production of the toolkit so it's useful for everyone. So here's five key messages we're suggesting that people might want to take forward 
because they can make a big difference. One is just, we've always got to be reiterating the urgency of action on climate change. The Glasgow Agreement Pact said, this is the critical decade for action, and it is. Um, secondly, we do have to get countries aligned with efforts to hold global warming to a maximum of 1.5 degrees. It's important for all of us. Um, we're nowhere near there yet. Substantial progress was made on Glasgow. More is required. And in essence, the Glasgow COP said to everyone, fail, come back again next year, increase the commitments. And that's particularly important for developed countries to continue to increase the commitments to cut emissions. Thirdly, finance is really important here. And developing economies deserve and need as a matter of uh, justice, but for action, they deserve and need adequate finance to help with both emission reduction, transitioning to clean economies, uh, and also for adaptation. Funding commitments haven't been met, promises haven't been met, and it's really important that developed economies, including Australia and New Zealand, strengthen funding assistance. Third thing is we all know the impacts of climate change are being felt now. We're feeling it in Australia. Um, you think about the disasters and impacts here. I'm sitting in Melbourne. Think about the disaster and impacts across the Pacific Island nations, many of which are extremely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. There's a need for finance to be available to help countries deal with impacts that happen now. It might be recovery from a cyclone. It might be bad erosion going on from sea level rise. It might be loss of biodiversity or fisheries. And so the Pacific nations are a really strong voice for a loss and damage facility or fund, if you like, that helps specifically with that. I mentioned side agreements. Finally, um, many countries signed a pledge to cut methane emissions by 30% by 2030. Methane's a very potent greenhouse gas. Um, Australia didn't sign that. There's a real opportunity at this COP to urge the Australian government to sign that. And there's an opportunity for all nations to be doing more on forests and oceans. So nature-based solutions, if you like, but also cutting emissions uh, from big industrial sectors as well. So looking at nations to make strong commitments in what we call side agreements. That's, that's some of the key messages sitting in that toolkit. Have a good look at it over your own time. It's got briefing sheets. Uh, and what we hope is it'll help you go out there and make a big difference in any way you can, and particularly make a difference in an area where we can all have an impact right now, which is national commitments and international action. Thanks, Kieran. Thank you, Don. That was fantastic uh, setting up the scene for us today. So now I'd like to um, just bear with me a second while I pull up my presentation again. So now I'd like to um, introduce you to Richie Merzian. Uh, Richie Merzian is the inaugural uh, Climate and Energy Program Director at the Australia Institute. Richie is a former Australian government representative to the UN Climate Change Conference and worked at the Department of Climate Change and the Department of Foreign Affairs for almost a decade on both domestic and international climate and energy agendas. While at the Australian government, he was the lead negotiator on an adaptation to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and helped coordinate the Green Climate Fund Board during the Australia, uh, Australia's tenure as chair. Richie helped co-found the Australian Youth Climate Coalition, which many of you will be familiar with, AYCC, in 2006. And he trained as a climate reality leader in 2007 with former Vice President Al Gore. Now, unfortunately, Richie isn't able to join us uh, live today as um, an unfortunate clash of uh, events meant that at very short notice, 
because he has had to MC another climate change event. Uh, but he sends his apologies and he has kindly recorded his contribution for us, which I'll play for you now. Thanks, Kieran. And I'm sorry I can't be there with you in real time. I guess that's testament to where climate change is right now in Australia. It's happening at full speed across many different areas. And that's a good thing. I mean, just in the last sitting period, Australia passed its first positive piece of climate legislation in ages, locking in an increase to its nationally determined contribution, that 43% emission reduction target by 2030. It's a significant increase, but of course, falls far short of where we need to go. A welcome first step. On top of that, all the independents, the Greens, the crossbench improved on that legislation, making sure that Australia integrates climate policy across the board, including in its financing agencies that have often in the past financed fossil fuel projects. So things are moving in the right direction. And Australia wants to take this newfound climate leadership global. It wants to host a UN climate conference in partnership with the Pacific. It's talking about being a renewable energy superpower, fueling the transition globally. The problem is this is not taking place at the expense of Australia's existing reputation as a fossil fuel superpower. And there's still over 100 new fossil fuel projects in the works in Australia. And that's a real point of contention. If Australia really wants to lead, if Australia wants to build the solutions and export them to the world, then it needs to stop with the problem, which unfortunately it's an expert at doing. Now, globally, in November, we will have COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt. Uh, now, this will be more of a working COP, or as the Egyptian ambassador told us, an implementation COP. It's about delivering on the things that were promised. The Glasgow COP last year was a big, prolific political COP with over 100 world leaders attending, including our own. Now, in Egypt, the point is to stop backsliding the buyer's remorse of having committed a lot last year, making sure that we don't go two steps forward and one step back. Because things have gotten harder since Glasgow, not easier. We have a global energy crisis that has even countries that are major exporters of energy paying more. We have cost of living and inflation pressures. We have increasing tensions geopolitically. Last year, a big win was having China and the US, the two large global emitters, the two largest economies, come up with an agreement, a dialogue on cooperation on climate that has since ceased. Now, Egypt will be tough. Australia will be exceptional in that it's coming with a good news story, and Australia has a key role to play in delivering on what it's promising at home and abroad. Beyond just the domestic agenda, Australia has an opportunity to step up on climate finance as well. Australia, unfortunately, is not a major contributor when it comes to its overseas development assistance. Only 0.2% of gross national income is dedicated to foreign aid. That puts us close to the bottom of the OECD, the other wealthy countries. Australia is a bit of a miser when it comes to development support. And even though it did commit to increasing its climate finance, it's still quite low. Globally, we've failed to meet the $100 billion that developed countries promised to mobilize per year by 2020. And Australia should be increasing its climate finance. And it should also be rejoining the Green Climate Fund. Australia under Prime Minister Morrison pulled out of the Green Climate Fund in 2018 via an interview with Alan Jones. And Australia hasn't rejoined. It's the only developed country that's not part of the UN's main climate financing vehicle that supports climate uh, action in developing countries. Just last week, we had two former presidents from the Pacific, Anote Tong from Kiribati and Tommy Romengasau Jr. from Palau, come to Australia and ask Australia to increase its climate finance, to rejoin the Green Climate Fund, and also to stop new coal and gas. At the end of the day, Australia has a real opportunity to lend support to the global process, but to show leadership as well. Australia is the third largest exporter of fossil fuels in the world, after Russia and Saudi Arabia. And if Australia really wants to help, then it has an opportunity to stop opening up new gas and coal projects. That'll be the challenge for Australia, both at home and globally. 
we have this cross bench, this super majority for climate action asking for Australia to stop growing the problem. And we have our neighbours in the Pacific, as well as many others, asking us also to play a role. The UN Secretary General put it best when he said that these wartime profits are insane and we shouldn't be investing in new coal and gas projects. And that's the challenge in front of Australia. The Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Chris Bowen, has said Australia is back. He wants Australia to be a world leader on climate change, on building the solutions and exporting them to the world. He wants Australia to host a UN climate conference in two years when it's not even Australia's turn to. And as part of that leadership, it's our job to set the expectations, to clarify what leadership looks like after so many years of Australia being in the wilderness. That means Australia increasing its climate finance. That means Australia building the solutions that it can export. That means Australia moving away from new coal and gas. So thank you, Climate Reality, for giving us the opportunity to share these ideas, these messages, and for creating a space for so many leaders to come together to shape what Australia can do for the future. Thank you, Richie, for those excellent insights and for lending your um, your deep experience to uh, to this session. So right now I'd like to switch um, tack a little bit and apologies. Um, I'd like to now introduce our next panelist. Uh, this is Kira Sherwood O'Regan. Kira Sherwood O'Regan Kaitahu is an indigenous and disabled climate justice strategist and the co-founder of social impact agency Activate. A regular COP attendee, she works with the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change and Sustained Ability, Disability and Climate Network to advocate for the rights of her communities in the climate negotiations. And at home in Te, Waip uh, Te Waiponamu, uh, Kira trained as a climate reality leader with Al Gore in 2018. Uh, Kira Kia Ora, and uh, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Tēnā koe, uh, Kieran, thank you so much. Tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, kia ora, ko Kira Shiura Regan tō kuikua. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, my name is Mikera. Uh, so as Kieran has uh, kindly introduced, my name is Kira, and I have a real privilege today of speaking to you all um, about climate justice and about what an amazing intervention this is to have uh, the Climate Reality team put together this toolkit for you all. So I, I think a lot of the uh, a lot of the technical points have really been covered already, particularly by Don with that great synthesis around you know what cops are like. So I'll maybe orient this corridor, this conversation, um, a bit more towards our climate justice experience uh, on the ground. So climate justice to me really starts with recognizing that we are newcomers to an intergenerational conversation, and the reason that I say that is because climate justice recognizes that climate change as a phenomenon has not occurred in a vacuum. It's fundamentally about people and it's about human systems. So climate change didn't just begin when Western scientists decided to develop a word for it or to be studying it. Climate change has been a really gradual process that has in large part been produced by the systems that we as human beings have set up. And so what I mean there is that if we look at economic systems of capitalist extractivism, for example, it's imperative for growth at all costs and its willingness to extract until there is nothing left to extract is one of those systems that is ultimately at the root cause of climate change. Colonialism is another such system where we've seen you know, other countries, particularly in the global north, travel across the world millions of miles to go and extract resources and subjugate indigenous peoples in those lands in order to sustain lifestyles that we know are out of step with our planetary boundaries. And while there are many other systems, I will just touch on also ableism as a disabled person myself. So ableism is that system of oppression and discrimination against disabled people. And that's really intertwined both with capitalism and colonialism. It's tied to the Industrial Revolution, uh, where we saw a lot of those greenhouse gases spiking up, but where we also saw this process of human beings being valued based on how much we can produce and how much work we're able to generate for profit. So all systems of human oppression are bound to each other, 
and bound to climate change. They reinforce each other and they reinforce climate change in these ways. And I say that this is an intergenerational conversation because for as long as these systems have existed, there have also been humans fighting to dismantle them. And so when we think about movements for land rights, for treaty recognition, for preserving our mahika kai or our food gathering areas and practices, when we talk about deinstitutionalization of disabled people or protecting our indigenous languages, all of those movements are working at dismantling those human harming and climate harming systems. So whether our people use the language of water protection or land back, or whether they use the language of climate change, we have to understand that all of this work is climate action. All of this has been a conversation going on for generations and generations, even if the language we use is different. And I really want to enforce that as daunting as that can be, the good thing about human systems is that they are completely changeable. It is really up to us uh, to change those systems and having societal systems where um, they are grounded in respecting our planet and respecting our non-human or more than human relations and grounded in respecting each other is actually entirely within our control. So climate justice to me really gives language to that recognition um, that climate change has not occurred or developed in a silo and it will not be solved in one. Indigenous communities, disabled people, folks in the global south, all of those people who are experiencing climate impacts first and worst, we're not only passive victims of climate change, but we're active agents. We have valuable knowledge. We have innovations and solutions to get us all out of this climate crisis that we find ourselves in. They might not look like easily uh, packageable or projectizable solutions, but the reason for that is that climate change is not going to be solved on its own by one magical technological innovation or by one project or by quick fixes. It is only going to be solved by systemic change and we're only going to achieve that systemic change by our relationships, by building those relationships and having our communities come together. So whether you're indigenous or disabled or not, and whether you're going to be on the ground at Sharm El Sheikh or not, you can do that work of relationship building and supporting our communities now. And as someone who has been on the ground at very many COPs working with Indigenous and Disability Caucuses, I can tell you that we're really thin on the ground. Attending COPs is really logistically, financially, politically and emotionally challenging um, for a lot of people. And many of our people, particularly across the Pacific, you know, are unable to participate because of that. And so I think that that's why it's really important that we have, you know, people like yourselves who are on the call, all of our climate reality leaders and the rest of the community um, being able to back us up because those who are on the ground, we really need all of the support that we can get. And in November, the eyes of the world are going to be on COP as we've already heard. There's undoubtedly going to be significant media and social media coverage. And we need our allies and those who believe in real and meaningful climate action to be driving the narratives that come out of that. On the ground at COP, things change in a matter of moments. And really what happens is that those with power, resources and personnel frequently end up driving the conversation. They drive that conversation externally and what's happening externally definitely influences the outcomes that are internally decided within those negotiation rooms. We really can't risk our voices being drowned out by those corporations and parties who seek uh, only to protect their bottom lines with little regard to the communities and countries already bearing the brunt of climate change and climate disasters. So that's why I'm really grateful that the team have put together these resources so that whether you're going or whether you want to be supporting from home, you can be using these resources, these key messages and these tools so we can get prepared ahead of time. We can really ground ourselves and get that collective power ahead of time. So when it comes to November, it's our voices that are speaking the loudest and they are saying climate justice. Noreira, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you so much for having me and a huge mihi uh, to all of you at Climate Reality for this amazing work that you put together for us. Kia ora. Thank you so much, Kira. Uh, thank you deeply for those fantastic insights and that really clear, compelling call uh, for all of us to be active allies um, between now and Egypt and beyond, of course. 
so now I'd like to um, bring in our next panelist. Um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Anika Molesworth. Dr. Anika Molesworth is a farmer, a scientist and storyteller. She is widely recognized for her work in agriculture and food systems and generating climate change awareness and is author of, um, I hope you can see that, Our Sunburnt Country. Uh, she is a founding director of Farmers for Climate Action, a national network of over 7,000 Australian farmers undertaking climate change action. Awards include Young Farmer of the Year in 2015 and Young Australian of the Year, New South Wales finalist in 2017. Anika is passionate about ensuring the best possible future for the planet, people and the food on our plates. She trained as a climate reality leader with Al Gore in 2016 and has also mentored new climate reality leaders in more recent years. Anika, thank you and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kieran. And I'm feeling very motivated and inspired after listening to Kira and Richie and Don yourself. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Thank you so much for having me along. Um, as Kieran just mentioned, I am a farmer and agricultural and environmental scientist and author, but you know, a very, very proud member of Climate Reality. So I want to bring in to this conversation today uh, food and farming systems in the context of climate change, what it means for those systems and how they can be part of the solutions. So agriculture holds a very unique position on the topic of climate change in that firstly, it is part of the problem. Secondly, it is one of the most vulnerable and exposed sectors to the impacts of climate change. And thirdly, and most excitingly, it is part of the solution. So let's break those things down. How is agriculture part of the problem? Well, as we know, we produce greenhouse gas emissions, methane from ruminants, such as cattle, sheep, goats, nitrous oxide emissions from fertilizers, nitrogen fertilizers like urea, carbon monoxide from vehicles, uh, we also graze vegetation, we use soil and uh, water resources. So all of these things have an impact on our environmental system. Agriculture is one of the most vulnerable and exposed sectors to the impacts of climate change and climate change impacts what food can be grown and where, the cost of food, as well as its nutritional value. So the increased frequency and intensity of extreme weather events like droughts, floods, forest fires are felt firstly and very really by the people who live and work so closely with the natural world, the farmers. They also notice changes in pest and disease prevalence and distribution, higher temperatures, reduced rainfall means less water resources to grow crops, to water livestock, that also flows onto social impacts. So uh, loss of jobs in rural communities, rural to urban migration, which we're seeing around the world, that increasing disconnect between people who live in the cities and the farmers who feed and clothe them, economic impacts, um, you know, the cost of producing food becomes more dear, uh, also the cost of remediation. So actually fixing things after a flood or a fire, you know, it is actually very expensive for us to reinstall infrastructure, fix roads, fix fences. There's also the huge mental toll actually living through these extreme weather events impacts people very really. But going on to the solutions, and this is the really exciting part of the piece. There are so many ways that agriculture and food systems can help us reduce greenhouse gas emissions and look after the environment. So looking at a farm level, how do we reduce greenhouse gas emissions? So many ways. For instance, low or no-till cropping to reduce uh, carbon dioxide emissions, fertilizers placed at the right rate, placement timing, diversified crops, especially perennials and trees, and also native plants, are improving ruminant genetics and feed, which reduces the methane emission from those ruminant animals which produce the methane. We can also look at alternative proteins, insects, algae, seaweed. We can get really creative here. Also, renewable energy has such an important place 
in rural communities and the agricultural sector. A lot of farming businesses are quite high energy users, but we also have expansive land sizes. So if farmers can be the ones to host solar panels, wind turbines, they could receive secondary and stable sources of income, which help them ride out the rough times like the drought. Uh, there's also very important conversations around women, education and empowerment in rural communities, capturing carbon and vegetation and soils and moving away from farm. What can we do at home, you know, in the cities? So many things uh, by reducing food waste, by paying a fair price for food. So farmers have the financial resources to adapt, to install technologies and practices that help us reduce emissions and also by choosing food wisely. Every time we go to a supermarket or a farmer's market, the food choices we make have a flow and effect to the farmers. So buying local, seasonal, nutrient dense foods, native foods from good farming systems, that helps us support the farming systems which are climate smart and resilient to the impacts. And having climate smart farming systems actually has so many benefits, you know, environmental benefits being more productive land through increased soil fertility and better biodiversity health and functioning of ecosystems. And that land is then more resilient to droughts or floods or these challenging climatic conditions. Having the environment and better, better health has a lot of social benefits too. So the obvious cleaner air cleaner water more nutritious food that means community stability too especially in rural communities and being climate smart in farming systems actually has a whole lot of economic benefits as well because it opens up new jobs and varied income sources it increases the product value through new markets because a lot of consumers they're looking for environmentally responsible food and fibers they will pay more for carbon neutral foods. So that actually has a lot of benefit to farmers who are involved in these practices. So how do we as individuals create that positive change and support this positive uh, transformation or evolution? Well, we obviously need to use our political influence, that's our votes, as well as continued engagement with MPs. It's using our financial influence so investing and buying the world that we want to create, spending our mining wisely, and also using our, you know, our personal influence in walking the talk, you know, using our voice, engaging in communities of action. For example, Farmers for Climate Action, you know, we have over 7,000 farmers here in Australia who are leading the conversation on climate change. And anyone, farmer or non-farmer, can be part of this movement and support farmers in this way. And as I mentioned before, it's also the food choices, buying local seasonal nutrient dense food, paying a fair price, not wasting food too. In terms of COP, we've got this exciting event coming up. I was very lucky to attend COP in Paris. Uh, when the signing of the declaration happened, I actually had tears in my eyes because I was so um, excited by the prospect of this. But they are words and what we need to do as a community is to convert those words into activity. 80% of the NDCs, nationally determined contributions to limit emissions include the agricultural sector. So there is huge room and opportunity within the food and farming system to make meaningful contribution on acting on climate change. So this is a moment to lift our voices, to draw attention to the issues to our families, our friends, our policymakers, to engage in media and all outreach platforms that we have availability to, to use the climate reality toolkit and networks at our disposal. This is your moment to shine and the world absolutely needs your leadership. So thank you. Thank you, Anika, for being such a committed climate reality leader and, um, you know, representative of regional Australia and um, articulating so clearly for us the, the systemic role impacts on agriculture and the role that they will play in the solutions and the call to action um, in, at an individual and household level for all of us also. And that makes a nice segue um, for us to talk now about the uh, the toolkit itself and the resources 
that uh, we are providing. So if you bear with me a second, I'm just going to pull, pull up, pull this back up for you again. All right, I hope you can you can all see that. So, um, so the resources that we've provided, and, and you, there is a link in the chat to uh, the resources on the website. Um, we, we've broken it down into um, an explainer, a one-page explainer, which uh, runs through the key messages, the five key messages, which Don uh, covered for you at, at the outset of this session, uh, the six ways to act for climate, and then there is a, a briefer, like a you know, a, a, a briefing of the themes that we've talked about within the key messages. And I can see some of the questions in the chat are uh, are about some of the topics that we're covering within that. We also, for the, the climate reality leaders on this call, um, you know, you've got access to all of the slide decks, and we've also provided. Um, a module of 75 slides, which we'll make available to you on Reality Hub and Box and Workplace. So keep an eye out for those. We also have um, a social campaign uh, within uh, the web, within the brief, within the explainer as well. So if if you could all, um, you know, during the session or immediately afterwards, have a look at at those social campaigns and reshare them with your networks as Anika, Kira and uh, Richie articulated, it's about building this um, wave, this moment, this momentum across all of your networks. So um, appreciate if you can share that through your networks um, and, uh, and get everybody activated around the toolkit. With that then, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the uh, six uh, the six calls to action, and I'll run through these quite quickly because I think we're uh, we're running a little bit against the clock, and I want to make sure we allow enough time for your questions. But essentially, if you have a look at those uh, calls that we've provided, they are things like, of course, reading the briefing paper that we've provided for you. All of our climate reality leaders, there are two thousand four hundred of them across this region, trained by Al Gore you can request a presentation from any of us uh, and you can do so via the request a presentation button. Uh, and then you can also download Al Gore's own uh, Truth in 10 slideshow. So this is a 10 minute um, presentation by Mr. Gore of the, the science, the impacts and the solutions. Uh, and as I say, you can ask for a presentation on that by one of our leaders. We would also want you to uh, use this toolkit by yourself or with, with a group of others, whichever works for you, to engage your local uh, elected representatives. You can call them up, uh, you can write to them using the key messages that we've provided. Even better is to follow those actions up by asking to meet with them and uh, talk to them about why you, you think COP27 is important and why they should think so too. You can write a letter to the editor um, of a newspaper or magazine using the key messages. And then as I mentioned, we've provided the uh, social media toolkit. We'd love for you to share that through your community and networks and please tag us with hashtag climate reality number two, Egypt. So thank you very much on that front. Um, so as I said, we're running a little bit uh, a little bit behind time. So I'm going to turn to the questions at this point and see what has come up. So I can see a question here from uh, Tony Boatman. Um, actually, you know what, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. I'm going to um, pull up one of the questions, which is one for one of our panelists. Um, Anika, this is a, a message from um, Margie Putinen for you. Anika, is there an online resource for determining which farms produce sustainably, for example, which brand of milk to buy? Not one that I can think of off the top of my head, but Paul Wood has very kindly uh, 
put a comment in the chat as well saying that if you look at the major dairy manufacturers in Australia, uh, many of them have sustainability plans with targets for reduction of emissions. So potentially going to the source and looking at their commitment to the environment and emissions reduction would be a good place to start. Great, thank you. Um, Don, this is one for you uh, from Thelma Raman. What can be expected to happen on climate finance or loss and damage at COP27? Um, and any of the other panelists who would like to follow up Don's comment on this, please do so. Uh, Thelma, thanks so much. Thanks, Kieran. Uh, Thelma, you're very astute because these are going to be two of the biggest issues on the table, if you like, at the COP. They're both up for grabs. So there'll be a lot of pressure on developed countries to bring more finance commitments uh, to the table and get it to where the promises need to be and start thinking ahead. So it's a great opportunity to really raise awareness and push our decision makers on this issue. Richie mentioned Australia joining the Green Climate Fund. That's important. Australia and New Zealand should look at stronger commitments into finance for the COP, but our politicians are going to need a good old push uh, to do that. Loss and damage, developed countries are resisting action on it. So once again, up for grabs and needs a really good push. Thanks, Thelma. Uh, any of the other panelists, would you like to add your thoughts on that question? Yeah, I think uh, it's Keta speaking. I think Don's really covered it, that we really need to get a strong outcome, particularly on loss and damage this COP. Um, I know that a lot of people, um, you know, within my community and also um, a lot of folks from the Global South are obviously really, really keen to see a strong outcome on loss and damage here, um, but also particularly particularly to be considering how that actually happens, um, because we've seen a lot of promises, particularly from the global north, um, particularly from those countries who have, you know, really caused climate change through their actions, because this didn't happen over a short period. This happened over those, you know, legacies of colonialism, as we've said, um, and a very, very long time contributing to those carbon emissions. And yet, you know, we're consistently seeing promises being made that aren't kept and where promises are maybe being kept slightly or where there is some action, oftentimes there are challenges there in terms of it not actually getting to the communities um, who need it, uh, to organizations that do come from those communities, be that global south, be that indigenous communities as well, really having to jump through a lot of loopholes to access that. And so we really wanna make sure that in addition to uh, getting a good outcome you know, politically, we want to make sure that the conversation is really geared around how do we make this as accessible as possible for people on the ground. We need to be able to mobilise those funds really quickly when climate disasters happen. And the way that uh, the Global North is, you know, really disseminating and distributing things can be a real issue um, for our people on the ground. So I think that's one key message I've heard um, a lot of our folks really trying to reiterate and get strongly on the agenda this COP. Great, thank you, Kira. Um, another question here from Tony Boatman, um, and I'll open this up. Uh, yeah, I think you know you might be uh, you had a, have a view on this, Don. Um, it is where is the Australian government's bid to host COP at? And I know that um, Richie Merzian also uh, had some thoughts on this, but um, what what are your insights on, around that, Don? Uh, Kieran, we don't know how it's going to be received. I noticed the Pacific Island Forum meeting of leaders middle of the year endorsed it. So I think there's going to be a formal offer from Australia and Pacific nations on the table at the COP. The, the COP has a, a curious cycle of looking at different regions um, and taking turns on regions as to who should host. So behind the scenes, there's some, uh, this region here, our region won't come up technically for another four years, I think, 
but there's some talk about potentially Germany standing aside uh, from uh, a European spot in two years' time. But a bottom line here, I think it's a really good and important thing for Australia and the Pacific nations to have the hands up uh, because it would bring the attention of the world onto our region. But we've also got such urgent needs and examples of needs and solutions that we could play a really, really important leadership role in the run up to a COP uh, and at it, of course. Great, thanks, Don. And I believe uh, Minister Bowen is in New York right now trying to advocate for Australia to host that COP. But as you say, it's um, an opportunity for us to show the importance of COPs more generally, um, you know, through uh, the toolkit that we're providing this time. Um, we've got a question around uh, deforestation and uh, this is coming from a few, a few participants around the current status of the global pledge uh, that took place at COP26 and whether there have been any funds committed. Is anyone tracking this robustly? Um, who, would like to, who would like to take that one on? Kira or Anika, do you want to jump in or shall I say a, a couple of remarks? If you want to say a few remarks, Don, about yeah, the, the funding of it or where it's at currently, that would be fine. I'll do it quickly and Anika, you might want to add. Um, so it's a great question and it's a big question about how does one track and ensure delivery of these side agreements? And there's actually not a formal process on that. So uh, it's a great question we should be asking of the decision makers. How are you going to track this? Uh, how are we going to ensure it's delivered? How should it be reported in to say, for example, every uh, international negotiation that's held annually? There's a lot of action going on, but it tends to be with like, for example, the Nordic countries putting aid money or programs into forest conservation into particular regions. So there's a lot going on. Is it enough? No. There's an underlying policy issue that needs to be looked at because what we're also seeing is while there's substantial monies, for example, recently committed to the Congo Basin or over time to Indonesia, um, there's also a lot of monies going in by the same governments or the World Bank into activities that lead to deforestation. So we haven't really got a good alignment across global efforts. So more needs to be done. We need to ensure the activities that are undermining the action are looked at and stopped, and we need good transparency and reporting on it. And I'll just add a few more words to that. So just echoing what Don has said, but sort of reiterating that we cannot be losing more of the carbon sinks. So we cannot allow deforestation and the removal of these high carbon stores to occur. So in COP26, there was this deforestation pledge made, many countries side on, signed onto it. But unfortunately, we have still been seeing deforestation occur since the pledge was committed. So we really need to be asking ourselves, well, what is occurring within our system which is encouraging or incentivizing the removal of those trees, the removal of those carbon sinks? Is it, you know, because uh, there is great rural poverty out there and the removal of that tree is worth more than something else? So how do we actually fix some of these uh, injustices uh, that occur within the system? How can we as individuals, you know, pay properly for our food, which might be contributing to the removal of those trees, things like this. So how do we play a role in that deforestation story and how can we then play a, a positive role in making sure that those trees are left standing? Excellent. Thank you, Anika and Don. Um, we've got time, I think, for just uh, quick answers on one final question. Thank you, by the way, to Fiona Ryan and uh, Margie for that last question. Um, this next one is coming from Dylan, Dylan Quinnell. Um, beyond calling for additional financial commitments from the Australian government and asking them to rejoin the Green Climate Fund, 
do you see this COP as a good chance to keep pushing the new Australian government to commit to no new coal and gas projects and an end to the huge public subsidies for fossil fuels? Who would like to take that one on? No, just do a no. quick comment. Absolutely, yes. So we should be pushing very hard. The Australian government will resist it. But um, that's why, um, uh, Nika, I think you said it best of all, that's why it's our moment to shine. Let's roll up the sleeves and get in there. Kira or Anika, any comments at all on that one? Uh, well, being from New Zealand, I, would, I wouldn't want to comment too much and, um, you know, will admit I don't follow, well, I do follow some of the politics and things, but I'm not as up to speed as others. Um, but I would just say that generally speaking, I think, you know, COP is a time when, you know, COP27 or any COP is a time when we do see a lot more attention um, on our political actors. And I think that can always be a time where we can leverage that extra visibility to say, hey, if you're going to be performing at this global stage, whether that's, you know, um, tendering to host COPs or whether that's, you know, participating or making statements in other ways at the COPs, I think it's always a really, really good time to be holding our leaders to account and say, if this is what you want to be saying on the public stage, this is what you need to be doing back at home. And so I'd say that applies to uh, everywhere, really. Exactly. <laughs> well said, Kira. Um, all right. Look, we, uh, we are very close to the hour. I've got two requests for everybody, uh, two requests slash suggestions for everybody on the call. Um, first of all, for we'd love to take a photo. Um, we don't get many chances to have group photos these days. Uh, so for, for those of you who are, are comfortable with putting on your camera, we'll take a quick shot. Um, get your, your beamers on. Are we all ready to go there, um, Christina and Imogen in the background? Yeah, you'll just have to give me a moment because I'll just have to move through the pages. <laughs> but yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll... Feel free to give us a wave, everybody, by the way. Okay, on the count of three. So one, two, three. <laughs> then we'll need to go again. <laughs> so um, in French, un, deux, trois. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much. Lots of happy, smiley faces. So thank you. Love the jazz hands. Uh, and the final request then is, uh, again, just to have a look at the toolkit, of course, and share it out through your networks, uh, book in presentations with our climate reality leaders. This is the moment to shine for all of you between now and uh, COP27 in Egypt. And then just to wrap things up, a huge thank you to all of you uh, for joining us for this session. A huge thank you to Richie Merzian, to Kira Sherwood O'Regan, to Anika Molesworth, to Do Professor Don Henry, and behind the scenes, uh, Imogen Butler for all your outstanding work, and Christina Wilson in the background too. Thank you very much, everybody, everybody and uh, we'll see you between now and Egypt, hopefully. <laughs>